Welcome to another episode of Crosstalk, your 6th Plymouth District edition with State Representative Josh Cutler representing not only the great town of Hanson, but Pembroke and Duxbury as well. Uh, representative has been very busy. We take time from, I want to say, I want to say quarterly. We try to get him in monthly when we can, but uh, we thought we'd take an opportunity to have him on uh, to chat a little bit about what he's been doing uh, during uh, COVID-19. Uh, the previous time we talked with him was, I would say it might have been three or four weeks ago. Does that sound about right? Sounds about right, yeah. How how are you? I love the view. I love I the view. Before I got a haircut, so that's how I mark time now, is whether pre-haircut and now post-haircut. So, okay. although it's getting time to do one again, but... I'm doing well. I'm sorry. I'm doing great. How about yourself? <laughs> I, I'm doing. I am doing. Oh, uh, doing okay. I have not yet, like you. I finally got a haircut. My hair looks. Yeah, good. I was gonna say you got a haircut. Yeah, I yeah. can tell. Uh, oddly enough, it felt like I was. I, um, the folks on the radio, the local radio station, were talking about getting haircuts, and I actually chimed in via text. And so the way they have it now, we kind of go in. I go to downtown Whitman to get my haircut, and I felt like I was. It was. I was on an assembly line. Yeah, I had to wait outside. Yep. Sit in the chair. Uh, she 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 couldn't have taken more. She, I want to say that she might have done maybe about fifteen snips. She was done. Snip, 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 snip. Okay, that'll be <laughs> this amount. Thank you. Out. Oh, so I had a good experience. I, I went to a local barber in Hanson, and uh, you know, same sort of process. You get in line and, and do that. And so I have to say, I make a confession here. The barber, my barber said I had the worst self haircut he had seen to date. Um, so there you go. Something to be proud of. Did you really cut your own hair though? I, well, I used one of those, you know, buzz things. And so I did. Yeah, I did. I mean, what do you do? Like, you know, desperate measures, call for desperate times. It, it's so. worth noting. I nearly did. I nearly did that. I used to cut my own hair using that. Number two on the sides and number four on top. Sounds good. And then, you know, you don't realize how bad it is when you don't. Yeah. You know, anyway. It's it all is. good now. It oh. is, but it, lo it looks definitely looks much better. Thank um, you. <laughs> what have you been doing? What have you been doing since the last time we chatted with you? Uh, especially, we'll start legislatively. What have, what's been going on? Yeah, uh, well, it's been busy. There's <laughs> lots going on, as you know. Um, you know, and, and just a lot of folks who need help. Uh, so, constituent services are you know the, the priority right now. Making sure we're, we're helping everybody who who reaches out. Um, but yeah, we are, we are, we are, uh, we're, the legislature is in session. We're meeting remotely for the most part, uh, but we are moving forward. We've uh, been fairly busy actually um, doing a number of COVID related pieces of legislation. Um, some, you know, smaller things like we just passed a bill that's now law to allow towns to um, reduce their quorum requirement for town meetings so that um, they can have a town meeting and not have to have 100, 150 people in, in one room. Um, some other steps we've taken to try to give our local leaders more flexibility when it comes to, um, you know, passing their budgets, having town elections, having uh, town meetings. I know there's many communities that are having uh, their town elections coming up, uh, some this Saturday, some next Saturday, um, most, of them, most of which were delayed from earlier in the spring. So those are all some of the things that we've been doing. Um, we did just recently pass a pretty significant bill in the House that um, is just moving ahead in the Senate, and that has to do with our fall elections. And I think it's important to, to take a moment to kind of share it with folks because it is uh, it is a big deal. And obviously, we're, everyone's concerned about uh, the fall elections, uh, both the state primary, which is September first, and the the you know presidential election in, in November. Um, you know, there are many folks who can't wait to go and vote in person and want a, that tradition, but there's just as equal me equal number of folks who are very concerned about voting in person and want to have the ability to, to be in their homes and, and vote securely and safely via absentee. And so the House uh, passed some legislation. Um, they basically, has a number of big things, uh, four, four big things, basically. Uh, number one is it, um, it, it expands the early voting period um, in November for a period of two weeks. Uh, folks who may recall from the last presidential election, we had early voting for, for a period of time. But this is going to be expanded. It's going to be two weeks, including two weekends. So people who want to go into their local polling area and vote ahead of time um, prior to election day can do so. Um, it also includes for the first time an early voting period in the, before the state primary in September, which we haven't had in the past. So there'll be a one week time period for early voting, including one weekend for their state primary. So that's one big component. It includes, uh, we're going to be mailing an absentee ballot request form to every voter 
uh, both uh, before the primary and again in September for the general election. And I just want to stress, we're, we're mailing an, a, a request form. We're not mailing the actual ballot. We're mailing a request form. So you'll get a postcard or you know, probably a postcard in the mail asking if you would like a ballot for uh, the general election and for the primary. Just mail it back, postage will be covered, and it goes back to your town clerk and they're able to you know, identify you on their rolls and then um, and send you an absentee ballot, just like traditional absentee ballot process that some folks are familiar with. And you know, many people do already vote via absentee. Um, we've had voting by mail since the Civil War. In fact, um, it's guaranteed in our Massachusetts state constitution. But we're trying to remove some of the, the roadblocks and the hurdles about absentee voting to make it much easier for folks. Uh, there used to be, you had to have one of three reasons in order to get an absentee. You had to have a religious um, reason or you had to have a physical disability. Uh, you know, you had, had one of the, you had to enumerate one of those three reasons to get an absentee, absentee ballot, excuse me. And so we basically removed those hurdles and made it a lot easier for folks to do that and to, to then vote uh, by mail, vote via absentee. Um, we've also, we're going to be creating a state portal so that people can go online and um, request a ballot. Again, not voting online. I just want to clarify that, but to request a ballot online. Uh, and to be verified and then have a ballot sent, just to make it easier and to give as many different tools and options to people as we can to make sure that they can exercise their right to vote. Uh, and, and finally, and certainly not um, without, uh, certainly not last but not least, um, we're making sure that election day itself uh, is protected and that there are you know, um, disinfecting processes and, and cleaning protocols in place, social distancing protocols in place. So the people who want to go in person and, um, and, and vote and cast their vote the way they always have can feel safe doing so. So a big bill that passed um, the House and has just passed the Senate this week. And we expect there'll be you know, a few little wrinkles to work out between the two versions and, and get to the governor pretty soon. So that'll be in place and folks can look for um, later this summer, um, in July, uh, so just next month, they'll most likely get their first postcard um, asking them if they want to request an absentee ballot uh, for the for the state primary September 1st. So some big doings there, um, which I think is important steps to take to make voting accessible uh, to everybody. So happy to support that. I was glad to see it pass on a very bipartisan basis, which is always uh, reassuring uh, um, that we you know can reach a consensus on these important issues. So. Uh, wanted to give that update, so thank you for giving me a platform to do that. <laughs> well, I would, I would, I want to extend your platform a little further, and that is, we had you on previously to talk about uh, uh, benefits for local businesses early on, if they had applied, uh, that the state government was putting forth. Um, I believe you might have also did a conversation about the CARES Act. Uh, anything, any new initiatives or or bills in the works for businesses as we are slowly coming out of COVID-19? Yeah, so it's still lots going on. Uh, so obviously the CARES Act, you know, passed by Congress had so many different aspects and facets. Um, we just learned this week that the um, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the EIDL, which some business folks are familiar with, has reopened. And so for anyone who has not already submitted an EIDL loan application, uh, they can do so. Previously, it was shut down and they were only allowing agricultural related um, businesses to apply, but now it's been reopened. So any business that includes uh, independent contractors, people who are self-employed can apply for that. Um, now this is a loan. It does have uh, an emergency advance feature, uh, which is a, a, an amount from $1,000 up to $10,000. It's based on how many employees you have. And that uh, is, does not need to be paid back. That's a, that's a, that's a, Give, you know, free money, so to speak. Um, nothing's free, but um, that, that is, does not need to be paid back. But then on top of that, you can apply for and receive um, a loan at very favorable uh, interest rates, 3.75% for, for most businesses and um, a 30 year payback term. So the EIDL is a good option for businesses of all sizes uh, and it, it has been reopened. So I'd urge folks who haven't already taken advantage of that to do so. It's sba.gov and you can follow the prompts. Um, the other thing I'd say, Kevin, is that the um, the other main loan program for businesses, the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, we love our acronyms, PPP and EIDL, um, that actually surprisingly still has funds. I know in the beginning, there was a mad dash. Everyone was concerned that only the, you know, the big companies were going to get it. Everyone's going to get boxed out. Congress reauthorized funds. And they, lo and behold, you know, we're now a month later and those funds are still available. 
uh, there is a deadline though, and that's June 30th is the clock strikes zero and that, that loan program stops. So if you haven't got your application in before June 30th for the PPP, you're gonna get shut out. So uh, I would urge folks who haven't already tried to do that to take a look at that. And that is something where you go through your local bank to apply. It's a very basic application. It's just a few pages uh, and um, you know you have to, some documents you'll have to dig up, but it's definitely worthwhile pursuing, especially now, Kevin, as we're reopening and many businesses are, you know, are back to business and maybe they're not, they're not back to full strength. You know, a few businesses are, uh, but this is frankly where they need to help the most. They're back open, but maybe not, you know, hundred percent. And so having some capital to help tide you over during that time period can be really helpful and, and you know, life-saving uh, for some businesses. So I would really urge anybody who hasn't already done that, the PPP to take a look at that. And certainly, you know, we're happy, our office is happy to help um, direct you, steer you in the right direction or answer questions to the extent that we can about either of those. Uh, so that those are that's a little news on, on both of those uh, fronts. Um, I think as uh, usually you and I sit down prior to uh, our conversation on camera and, and some of the things that we should think about touching upon, one of them that was, uh, you know, it's commonplace now since early March that you get to wear a face mask. Do you not have legislation in the works in regards why, to- Why, thank you for asking, sir. <laughs> no, uh, yes, that's true. So, you know, uh, you know, Kevin, what, uh, I had a, a local, a local uh, crafter who emailed me and um, asked a question, which uh, you know, I thought was a great question, is I'm selling, I'm making these masks and just selling them to my neighbors for you know, a small amount of money just to cover my costs. Do I need to charge sales tax? And I thought, geez, that doesn't make sense. You shouldn't need to charge sales tax for something like that. And then I looked it up and lo and behold, I was wrong. You, you do. <laughs> it's on the books, the Department of Revenue. Um, that is a taxable item. Um, here in Massachusetts, we exempt the sort of basic necessities of life. We don't tax basic food items or clothing uh, or, or other uh, base or medicine. We don't have a, a charge sales tax on those. But for other thing else, we do charge a sales tax of six and a quarter percent. Facial coverings, because they they weren't viewed in, in the past as a necessity, they were viewed more as a, a work tool for some. Uh, now they certainly become a necessity for all. Are charged that state sales tax, and so we filed legislation to exempt facial coverings from the state sales tax um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously, you know, it, it has a fiscal impact. It adds to the cost when you charge sales tax on an item. Number one, a, a modest amount, but nonetheless still. But two, and frankly, more importantly, I thought was that you know we have this whole cottage industry of folks who are you know, crafters and vendors who are now making these facial coverings, uh, these non-medical facial coverings for all of us, you know, and we don't wanna be using the, the, the medical grade ones. So this is, they're, they're filling an important need that we have here. We have a you know, tremendous need for facial coverings. And so to then ask those folks to navigate you know, the Department of Revenue tax code to then collect and remit sales tax when they're selling these uh, facial coverings, that seems like that's just going to create a disincentive for people to want to do that. And, you know, for those people who maybe aren't familiar with the law, like even I wasn't, and I'm a legislator, I wasn't familiar with the fact that that was supposed to be taxed. You know, they're going to run afoul of the tax code. And while I'm sure DOR is not going to be going out policing this, you know, to some great extent, it's still nonetheless, you know, would be a violation. They could be subject to, you know, penalties and fees. So we don't want any of that. It just makes sense now that this is a necessity that we should treat it like other necessities of life. And exempt it. So uh, it's a very simple bill, just exempts that one thing. Um, and um, that bill just actually had a, a hearing, a virtual hearing, uh, before our revenue committee this past week. And we had a good um, cross section of uh, legislators uh, supporting that. And so, you know, I think it's a common sense kind of thing that I'm hopeful we can, um, we can push, push through. I would ask you this uh, if you went into a store and bought a hat or you bought a shirt, there is no tax in Massachusetts. Right. For, right. for about unless, unless you bought a shirt over a hundred dollars and a certain amount, which I know you're you're a fancy dresser, Kevin. So maybe maybe your stuff would be, but you're right. Regular garments below a certain threshold are not taxed at all. They're not they're not subject to sales. So right, exactly. It's a good point. Definitely. I'm going to use that, Kevin. That's good. Thank you. Feel free to borrow it if you need to. <laughs> uh, I want to commend you on something. You uh, sure. you know the the South Shore legislation, uh, the 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 legislative uh, delegation. Uh, you guys are great collectively and working with each other, but you uh, have towered ab uh, amongst uh, above a, a lot of your your peers when it comes to getting the word out. They're not saying that other fo other individuals who are elected office aren't using the platforms you are, but I you are very visible. Whether whether I'm seeing 
you do something uh, on cable, if I've seen you do uh, something with the Hanson Business Network to promote business and any initiatives that are in the works, uh, how often do you, have you been doing stuff? Because it seems like every time I'm looking on social media, you're doing something, a new show, a I'm new talking, program. because I'm stalking you, Kevin. <laughs> no. um, yeah, no, uh, well, you know, that's the nice thing. I guess that's one of the upside of all this is that we're going through is that, you know, on the technology side, it, it is easier now to, you know, do our shows, uh, to do Zoom meetings with, you know, the Hanson Business Network or local chamber of commerce to do those kinds of events uh, with other legislators, you know, all the different things we do. Because, you know, technology is there and we can use it as a platform. And so um, being a bit of a nerd on the tech side, uh, it appeals to me to be able to do that. So, um, so but and a lot of my colleagues are doing, are doing good stuff with that as well. So, um, but yeah, I guess that's one of the upsides, the silver linings in this is that we're learning new ways to do things. And it's not just, you know, my area, but, I, you know, telehealth think about that how, how how you know that's a big you know i think a big step forward uh for healthcare. you know for many kinds of things it's 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 a better option not obviously for everything sometimes you need to see your doctor in person but for a lot of little things it's a it's a better process it's quicker it's faster it's, it's less expensive and um get better outcomes so um certainly technology has its downsides but this is these are areas where we can use it to our advantage do you feel that peg access centers like WHCA or PAC TV, it was just, a, just what, a year or two ago that we, we were concerned because the FCC was looking to, to change some rules and, and to try to uh, take advantage of the in-kind donations that were part of our licensing agreements. Do you feel that during COVID-19, we've really had a chance to shine? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I said that before, I think, um, you know, what I think about the different things that I do. And, and if it weren't for local cable access like yourself and, you know, we use PAC TV in the area as well, all the different forms that we've done or the local municipal selections meetings and school committee meetings that are being hosted, you know, how would those happen without our community access? I mean, they would be basically the public would, would, would almost be shut out. Uh, and with cable access, and instead of being shut out, it's just the opposite. We've opened it up to everyone. Think how much more open our, you know, local board of selection meeting is now that you can actually participate via sitting in your home, whereas before you had to go down to your town hall and watch, or you could, you could watch it on, on, on TV, but you couldn't really participate. And now because of this platform that you guys have, we're, we're opening that up and it's really democratizing um, government in, in that sense. And so I hope that we'll remember this <laughs> when this is done and, you know, try to do fine. I know that, you know, the cable access folks, you know, there's, they have some definite needs, um, just getting it in HD, uh, getting uh, on the, peg channels, um, getting funding sources, you know, are important things. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, I think everyone realizes that, knew that already, but I'm hopeful that there'll be a, a greater real, you know, understanding of that and, and greater making that a priority when this is over, the fact that where would we have been without our, our community access station? So um, absolutely, it's a great point. It's absolutely true. You guys, we really appreciate everything you guys do. And, and not just you, Kevin, but I know, you know, the, the people behind the scene there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, my brothers and sisters in access. Yes. Uh, talk to me about the marathon you did on Zoom with um, with class with a bunch of it was first graders. Oh yeah, I had uh, so uh, first graders in Duxbury. Uh, they the, one of the teachers asked me if I'd be willing to come on and, and kind of talk to the kids, and I said of course. And and so we we thought it would be easier to do individual classes instead of doing them all at once. Uh, and so there were nine <laughs> first grade classes in Duxbury and we did them all. Uh, we did Zooms with each one of them and we had a blast. It was, um, I would say, with all that is going on in the world, you know, all the issues with, you know, racial justice now we're talking about, Zooming with first graders is like, you know, the perfect thing to do because it just puts a smile on your face no matter what's happening in the world because they're so bright and curious and inquisitive and charming. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And, and while we're here, talk about this, Kevin, so I gave them a little quiz about some state symbols. And so if I could, I have a few maybe state symbol questions I can throw at you and maybe <laughs> our audience to try to guess uh, while they're listening at home. I know you are a very astute person uh, when it comes to government, so I'm sure you'll know a lot of these. Do you mind if I just throw a couple at you? Sure. I, I hope I don't disappoint your fans, though. I'm sure you will not. So as I said to the students, uh, we have a lot. We, we do a lot of important things at the state house, but sometimes we do things that are you know less important. And one of those is passing laws about state symbols. 
And in fact, oftentimes they come from the community, such as when we decided what the state insect should be many, many years ago. And it was because of a group of elementary school students in Massachusetts who decided this particular insect should be the state insect. So they petitioned their state legislator who then filed a bill and it went, lo and behold, it went through all the steps of the legislative process and was signed into law. And now the official state insect is this insect because of these elementary school students. And that, that happened in the 1970s. Uh, but there are other instances where students or other groups or constituency groups have um, weighed in. And, and because of their efforts, we now have new state symbols. Uh, so with all that as a precursor, do you know what our official state insect is? And don't look on your phone. I'm not. Somebody was sending me a message from my wife. Oh, uh, sure. No, we don't, no. we're, not buying, we're not buying that. Well, you know, I would, I would say with triple E, I'd say the mosquito, but I'd be more, more, I would probably lean more towards maybe a ladybug. I don't know. Oh, you knew the answer, didn't you? No, it's I didn't. Lady, you didn't? It's a ladybug. It's a ladybug. That's, it's, it's a ladybug. Good. I'm impressed. It's the ladybug. Excellent. It is, it's, it's, and it's because of this elementary school uh, in, in the 1970s, students there decided it should be the ladybug. All right, so that was a good one. Let me, let me give you a couple more okay. while we have all time. All right, and your readers and our viewers can kind of chime in too. All right, what is the official state berry? The official state berry of Massachusetts. Ooh, what is the official? Uh, part of me wants to say blueberry, but I think I'd be wrong. Kevin. Oh. Wait, wait, oh, no, cranberry. Where do we cranberry. live, man? Where cranberry. do we live? Cranberry. Cranberry, yes. Cranberry. The cranberry, of course. Yeah, yes, I remember cranberry. I said I wanted to say blueberry, but then I thought better. I'm glad you did not. I'm glad yeah. you did not. Yeah. All right. Well, in case it's, it's, it may be getting lunchtime where you are, how about the official state donut? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me the sandwich. Uh, donut. Donut. Boston cream. Boston cream. Wow. <laughs> Makes sense, I'm, doesn't I'm, it? All right. I'm impressed. Here's another one. Now, since I know we have a lot of Whitman viewers, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful they'll get this one. That's a big, that's a big hint. The wait, official, wait, wait. Full House Cookie. The official state cookie, yes. <laughs> you All said right. Whitman. Whitman was kind of, get, kind of gave it away. I kind of gave it away. All right. Here's another one. I'm not going to give this one away. Um, how about the official state children's book? Not so easy. The official state children's book. I do not know that one. You stump, you stump me. So I'll give you a hint. There's a night. There's a statue of this on the at the Boston Public Gardens, and it often gets dressed up sometimes at, on special occasions. Oh, um, this is the little ducks, is it? Yes. Okay. Make way for ducklings. Make way for ducklings. Make okay. way for ducklings. That's our okay. official state wow. uh, children's book. All right. You, yeah, let, let me stop while I'm ahead. All right. You did pretty well. <laughs> we'll, give you, we'll give you a B plus. <laughs> I'll take the B plus. Um, isn't the state sandwich peanut butter and fluff? So there actually is no state sandwich. <gasps> we might have that, would be, that would be room for growth. Uh, the latest state symbol debate, which I was a footnote in, was the official state rock song. Oh, Jim. Uh, Bob had st former state senator and now... Weymouth mayor, Bob Headland was, didn't he push for this? Wasn't this? And him and G a good friend of yours, Jimmy Cantwell, had yes. the, the dialogue had about it. Competing, we had competing entries for that, although we sort of patched things up and we came to some agreement, but, um, but yes, so. <laughs> I do remember that, because we had a conversation about that uh, uh, a couple of times. Yes. Well, we get a few minutes left here. A anything that we haven't touched upon during this episode of Crosstalk that you want to touch upon? Oh boy. Um, well, it seems like there's lots going on. Um, I guess, you know, a couple things I would mention quickly is um, uh, back to, to COVID, not to <laughs> go back to the serious stuff, but it is uh, still before us. Uh, we, we have passed, one of the things we're trying to do is make sure there's transparency about the data and making sure, we're making sure we have more data for, because I, I know everyone is concerned about that. And so we did recently pass legislation that was signed into law to provide more data um, number one for elder care facilities, but also in group homes and other um, DDS facilities, because we know people with disabilities um, are, very, you know, are, are a vulnerable population and we wanna make sure we have more data uh, being released about them. Um, so some other, and some other, uh, also having more data, frankly, about uh, racial disparities, because we see racial disparities in COVID-19 cases. So trying to make sure we have more um, data out there 
um, for folks. Uh, so that was good to see. Uh, um, Governor Baker signed that into law. Um, and you know, he's, they've expanded on their own the, the data points that they're releasing as well. And so, um, so that's really important. Uh, and I guess the other thing is, you know, we're, we're, we're in the, the reopening phases here, as, as, as everyone knows. Uh, phase two, uh, step one is now open. So, you know, we're seeing our, our restaurants open uh, for outdoor seating, uh, retail stores opening, you know, with some limitations. And we're expecting very soon that uh, step two of phase two will be, uh, will be announced to allow indoor seating um, and uh, other you know, personal. One thing I'm looking forward to is going back to the gym uh, so that personal training sessions, uh, close contact, uh, um, personal services like that, uh, other kinds of businesses. So we expect uh, step two of phase two to be announced pretty soon. And then sometime after that will be phase three. Um, but um, so, yeah, so those are some of the things that are, you know, I think, you know, important. Uh, and, and if we have time just quickly, I would mention um, we have seen, I know a lot of folks are, you know, are, um, working with us in terms of unemployment issues. Uh, sadly, many folks do need that. We have the, the new uh, pandemic unemployment benefit that um, is very helpful to people who are self-employed or independent contractors. Uh, but we have seen, and I wanted to let alert folks, some scams, unfortunately, uh, with people filing false uh, claims uh, using other people's data. So uh, in other words, someone impersonating Kevin Tachi and filing a claim for unemployment, and then you find out, hey, I just got approved for unemployment, I didn't ask for it. And um, and not realizing you know what's happening that it, it is part of a scam that's going on. It's an, it's a, it's not just a Massachusetts thing. It's happening all over the country, and it's not because of a particular data breach here in Massachusetts. It's it's people using data they've obtained somewhere else and then using that data to file a false claim uh, using your name or other people's names. We've seen a lot of instances of that happening. Uh, people calling us about that. So I just want to make sure people are aware because if you do see that happen, you don't want to just throw that piece of paper away. You do want to make sure you take the right steps because, you know, heaven forbid that they, they transfer the money to your bank account and it sits in your bank account and you don't realize it and you spend it, you know, you could be, you could end up owing the money back. Um, so you want to make sure that that does get reported. And if you go to mass.gov and, and uh, type in DUA, there's a whole page that explains the steps that you should take to alert them and, and, and so forth to protect yourself. And also, you know, things like putting a credit freeze or credit hold on uh, to make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, you know, somewhere else. So I wanted to mention that scam because we've seen, unfortunately, a lot of, of cases of that happening. Representative, if folks want to uh, reach out to you, I know you're, you're big on constituent services. You get a great staff uh, when they're allowed to be at the state house. Um, how can they reach out to you or be able to get in touch with you if they have any concerns or want to talk to you? Yeah, no, so we're still, uh, you know, um, we're still accessible anytime. Um, email, obviously, I the, uh, give me my email, josh.cutler at mahouse.gov. That email goes straight to me. Uh, also, you can reach my staff. If you go to my website, joshcutler.com. It has all our, all our phone numbers and email addresses for, for our staff. Um, but if you just email me directly, that's usually the easiest. I, I get all my email, and if I need to forward it on to someone, I can. Um, and uh, obviously, you were happy to you know, be, be reached via Facebook and Twitter and, and, and those methods as well. But email seems like the right now. These days, hopefully, it'll be in person soon. But uh, for now, it's email. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to at least uh, share the latest uh, things that you've been up to and, and what's, you know, available for folks if they are definitely in need or be able to reach out to. And I want to thank the folks who are tuning into this said program, because that's the idea of these shows is to better inform you as to some of the things that you are eligible for. And we are fortunate here in this region to have a uh, great representation up at the state house who are willing to talk on a regular basis until the next crosstalk six plymouth district edition i'm kevin tachi he's been josh cutler have yourself a great day mm -hmm.